Hey everyone, I'm super excited. Today, we finally get to look at Dan's um, FJ80. And we've been hanging out here in Alabama Hills. It's been just an absolute fantastic couple of days. Um, the weather's been perfect and you guys can see we're in this epic environment, it's awesome. We're gonna spend a little time with Dan. You are Overland Bound member 582. Right. Uh, we've known you for a really long time. It's been fun hanging out. Yeah. I've always been enamored by Dan's 80 series. We finally get to take a look at it. Um, Dan, you are VC Expedition on Instagram, correct? correct. Yeah. And I noticed that you have a, um, you've got a slogan which is form follows function. Yeah. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your, yourself, about that saying, how that came to be, and then we can talk about your 80. Sure. So uh, I'm, I'm an engineer with Toyota in the research and development in powertrain. And I've worked there for a lot of years, 30 years now. But back in engineering school, I had a professor that had a big poster of the SR-71 Blackbird on his wall. And underneath it, it said, form follows function. And the SR-71, to a lot of people, was just a not a very handsome plane. But the purpose of that plane was very clear. Go fast and fly high, right? And that really made an impact on me. And so uh, when I decided that I was going to come up with a name and a little bit of a slogan. It was more for me than anybody else, but it sounded kind of fun, you know, and, and the things I build for me, and we'll go through a few of them here, follow that mantra, form follows function, because they're not particularly good looking, <laughs> but they really perform well and they're right. strong. They may be a little bit overbuilt, but they're not going to break and they really perform their function well. And that's where it came from. And that's kind of what I stick with. Things that are, that are, fancy um, or maybe their form over function yeah you were saying earlier that they tend to exclude themselves rather quickly yeah. from your kit <laughs> they'll they'll dispose themselves and that's when you know you've underbought right or under designed right? right when something breaks you think all right it's time to an up to do an upgrade or it's an opportunity to buy something now that i know that i need that's going to perform yeah it's going to be durable and it's going to last Cool. All right. Hey, let's take a look. Let's start right up front here okay. um, with your bumper lights. And I see a couple other things on here. Yeah. So this is uh, an ARB, typical ARB. And when I, when I started building this, I've owned this since uh, 1998. It's a 95. Uh, I bought it three years used. It had 36,000 miles on it. And I immediately started building it. Um, this bumper was really the only game in town for an 80 series. And, you know, right out of Australia, they were a little bit hard to get, but I ended up with this one and I really like it. Uh, it's very heavy, but it performs a really good function. It holds um, the Smittybilt 12,000 pound winch. Uh, and and the, the best thing about it is it's part of the style that you, you can adapt when you drive because now you can use this corner as <laughs> an indicator of that's right where I want to be. When you're up against a rock and you're rubbing up against a rock because you want to ease down a step or something like that, yeah. you're okay with it because all you have to do is come up here and brush the dust off and, you know, it's your physical, it's all good. physical indicator. Yeah. You get a little resistance. From and, and you rocks. know you're not going to hurt it. <laughs> right. It's going to be there and you're not going to bend anything. Yeah. Um, the better the bumper looks, um, I, the better the bumper looks, the, the more research I do on that particular bumper. Yeah. If it looks really, really slick and streamlined. That's when I start asking questions. Yeah. I notice you have a, an air check here. I do. Built into the bumper. That goes along with the onboard air compressor that mm -hmm. I have on board. And I've got wires, uh, lines plumbed up to the front and the rear bumper. But this is really handy because I have, when I go to air up, which is pretty frequently, I just pop this cool little cap off here mm -hmm. and I can plug into a line and I have just a short line that I can do the front tires and then I've got one on the back that I can do the back tires or I have a system then that I can air up all four tires at once. I have sort of a manifold system that I've made that I can do all four tires at once. That's pretty handy. Lights? Lights up front. Um, pretty old school. These are just halogen lights. Um, they work great for fog, but that's about yeah. all. So that's why I put these on here that are sort of a, a spotlight, straightforward, bright light 
that work pretty well. These are not any particular brand, but I've found that um, as I decide that I want something here, that now I might upgrade to a, to a better light, mm -hmm. to, a, to a higher end, higher quality light. Now that I've decided that, yeah, this works, I'm gonna, you know, it's worth the money, it's worth the investment to have that up there. Try it out, see if you like it, then execute all the way. Exactly. Yeah, got it. Exactly. Cool. Um, I like this. The, yeah, it's uh, a little bit raggedy, but I don't want to. I don't want to break your license. Oh, break, it's but, uh, yeah. This is I, just. I like that. This is just a little. Yeah, you know, quick great. access. Uh, I have a cover for the winch. When I think I'm going to use the winch, I take the cover off and I kind of prepare this. This is just one of those little <clears> flashlight <throat> holders that flips down and. Yep. It holds it pretty tight. That's it doesn't great. rattle. Cool. Well, hey, should we? Uh, should we take a look into the engine room? Yeah, sure. All right, let's do it. All right, now, there's a couple of special things under this hood here. This is not entirely stock. No, not, not entirely. <laughs> Mostly, there's a couple of things I've done. One of the things that uh, I did early on, uh, I work at uh, Toyota, and right across the next building, uh, TRD was doing their supercharger development on a couple of different engines. And I talked to the guy that was in charge of the supercharging supercharger uh, program and pretty much convinced him that the 1FZ needed a supercharger. And I had just the thing for him. And there was a company down in San Diego that was already building one, but they weren't marketing it very well. And so TRD approached him and they actually bought all of the stuff to make it a TRD. And when something gets made into a TRD part, it, it's, it goes through quite a bit of engineering. So they needed a car to do that. And of course I offered mine. And, uh, and so they took this and they had it for three or four months. Mm -hmm. And they did the development of the supercharger on it. They made the special plenum and the attachment, the fixtures, all of the, all of the castings and everything that were required. Um, and this is a low pressure supercharger. Mm -hmm. It only is about six and a half PSI but it's just enough to help overcome all of the weight that I've added with bumpers and winches and batteries and tire carriers and extra fuel and everything like that. Uh, it, it dynoed out at about 300 horsepower at the wheel when mm -hmm. they were done with it. It, it. it just is enough to get it back to where it really should be, uh, which is right. being able to go at least 55 miles an hour up the hills. <laughs> I got distracted at the point where you said this is the TRD supercharger prototype vehicle. Pretty much. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it was unique. I had to go without my car for, you know, three or four months. Yeah. But it, uh, how many miles does your rig have on it now? Just a little over 160,000 miles. It's a baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I try not to drive it too much, Yeah. especially the short trips, but yeah, these long trips, I'd love to get it out and stretch it out. And, yeah. It's just such a comfortable car and it's so fun to drive. I've had a dual battery system for a long time. This, uh, the stock uh, from 94, 93 on had the battery on the driver's side, but the 91 and 92 80 series had the battery on this side. So all I did was get the battery box that bolts right in and I put in the second battery and I made a, a solenoid here. It's a 200 amp solenoid that I control with a switch that does three things by the switch. It either completely disconnects the batteries so they're, they're completely disconnected and only the starting battery will charge. It connects them together so they're always connected together no matter what. Or the third position is it only connects them together when the engine's running. And um, I wasn't aware of any thing that I could buy at that time that did what I wanted it to do. And I knew that's what I wanted it to do, so I had to make my own. Mm -hmm. So I got into the wiring diagrams and I decided what I needed to do. And by using this solenoid, uh, this is I think my third solenoid before I found one that was, that was heavy enough to be able to do that full time, um, to be able to connect them together. And just by moving that switch, I can do whatever I need to do if my starting battery is dead, then I can jump it just with a flick of a switch from my second battery very easily. It's a nice insurance policy, yeah. especially when you're off the grid. Um, 
You had mentioned also that you have added some uh, additional cooling to your vehicle. Yep. Yep. And yeah, how'd you do that? Well, the the thing that I noticed when I would go slow in four wheel drive and not a lot of air moving across the radiator was that my air conditioning wouldn't work very well and I really like air conditioning. So I decided that I needed to add, and I did the blue hub clutch fan modification and you know the special fluid and everything and that worked, That I saw some improvement there but still I saw a need when I was going slow, I wanted to force air across the radiator. So I went and robbed a, a Taurus, Ford Taurus V6 engine electric fan and I mounted it in front of the radiator, in front of the AC condenser, and I can turn it on with a switch on my dash that pushes air across my radiator, and that helps cool it down, that helps keep the air conditioning cool, and it helps me better manage the engine coolant temperature, which is super critical on these engines. You really wanna keep it in a, in a pretty narrow range between about 85 and 105 at the, at the max. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, the, the air conditioning switches off at, at 108 yep. C. Yep, everybody that, that has driven up a long, long grade with air conditioning on under full load has, has felt that concern when their air conditioning is blowing warm suddenly. Yeah. And what, what happens is, is your, your AC clutch shuts off at 108 degrees C, uh, coolant temperature. And um, as soon as it cools back down to about 103, it will turn back on but it'll just cycle between those two temperatures until you change one of those things, either ambient temperature or engine load. And so um, I, I just want to watch that engine temperature very carefully. Yeah. You know, I don't want it to get that hot. And so. do, you, uh, do you monitor that with a, um, do you have a digital readout? Did you add a digital readout so you have more accurate reading? I do. It, they have a couple of different things. They have a, a scan gauge and they have an ultra gauge. If your car has the OBD port, it just plugs right into there, and you can program it to see what engine parameters you want to read. I happen to have the ultra gauge that worked out for me, and uh, one on the on the very front page, I have water temperature right where I can see it, and so I know when I'm uh, driving under load, like we were yesterday. You know, we were going up that long, and it wasn't very hot out. We were going up that long grade and moving pretty slow, five to 10 miles an hour, but the engine was working really hard. And so I wanted to be sure that that coolant temperature was down. So I had the fan going on all the time and I knew exactly where my water temperature was. Yeah. And if it gets too hot, I will do something to, I'll stop and let it cool down and let it idle and cool the air a little bit. Yeah. I see some money uh, being spent in my future. In I my think I future. can help you do that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I had that cooling fan, I wouldn't have been shooting gas out of the gas tank. <laughs> <That> probably. <laughs> or, or it seemed to me that we had a problem with uh, the top of the radiator. Uh, on. Radiator problem. Maybe that. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I don't. That's a, one of those memories that you'd like to forget. <laughs> Um, and thanks for your help then as well. <laughs> you know, that was one of those things that you just put in your memory banks and think, "Wow, that's a keeper." Yeah. <laughs> Another thing is uh, that we've got under the hood is just the the uh, when you run diff breathers, you want to run them up to a, a point where um, you're kind of aware where the water is. And in the engine room is a good place to put that. So I got the ARB diff breather kit, and it comes with that little uh, thing right there on the firewall. That's what I have is that one. And I found that that was, for me, it was not very sufficient. I've got uh, royal purple in my diffs. And for some reason, it was um, not, that wasn't satisfactory. So I put in this PCV thing right there. Uh, it's actually a... Uh, uh, just a, a catch can that I've repurposed to run both of my diff lines into that. And then it has a fluid indicator. So if I am pushing fluid up through those lines by any chance, I'll be able to see it in that site and be able to monitor that. But that's, that solved that that's, problem. <clears throat> that's fantastic. Yeah. That is really, really cool. Um, I have a cloud of, of, uh, yeah. Diff 
fluid around. And around I'm not sure why that happens breather. because yeah. your stock diff breather, diff breathers, <clears throat> you know, they get oily around the little valve. They get kind of mucky and then they collect dirt and, you know, then after a while they become in-op. Yeah. So that was, this is kind of the, <laughs> that's good. That's great. You yeah. know, that, that's, <laughs> exactly. that's the way my brain thinks. All right. I'll get a parts list from you later. Right. <laughs> Amazon is your friend. <laughs> All right. Should we uh, take a look inside? Yeah, sure. All right. Great. So this is Command Central in here. Okay. <clears throat> this looks familiar to me. This is a, a lot of iterations. Okay. Um, I guess uh, one of the things I've... I've concentrated on especially lately is uh, communications okay and I have uh, worked into three different types of communication my primary communication is a ham radio mm -hmm. and I've got a base mounted unit it's a Yesu FT8800 it's a really good unit it's a dual band unit I can uh, get uh, 70 centimeter and 2 meter uh, radio. I've got a four foot fire stick antenna to support it. I've seen a lot of folks use the ASU. Yeah, it's a good brand. It's a well established brand. They, their quality is really good. Their audio is super good. I have, I have very little problem with it. Mm -hmm. If I can pull my microphone out of the abyss here, I can also show you my Cobra WX75 that I use. And this just, you know, it has a hidden unit itself that I plumbed into here and um, use it, this one everything is in the in the handset and that's for CB and I've got a four foot fire stick on the back for that they're cute little matching four foot fire sticks on the back <laughs> looks good but they actually function so that's why that's what it's all about um, and then the third thing is with the inReach Explorer this is really handy um, I finally talked myself into that when I didn't have cell phone communication and I was off grid enough that uh, my family became worried about me. Mm -hmm. When I finally be came back on and got back into communication, I found out that they were about to call the Rangers <laughs> to come find me. So that's why this is handy because that uh, not only is a great mapping and a location uh, tool with a, with a linked iPad or a linked tablet of some kind. Yeah but also the communication tool through satellite. That's why inReach is so great. Right. So there are no no blackout uh, spots right. globally. In Literally no no place where I can't communicate some, right. in some way. And then, of course, the, the scary <clears throat> SOS button that you never want to push unless you really need to right. because they come with helicopters and, <laughs> and everything, could apparently. Be expensive. And it could be expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a couple of different buttons here. Uh, that I've uh, wrangled. I have solar. I have a solar panel on top, and I can control the input to either battery with a switch here. Um, I can go. I can push it to the second battery or the first battery, whichever I want to, with a switch, and then I can read the voltage. Um, here's the switch to control my battery, and you can hear the solenoid up there clicking when I push that. Um, so that's a three position switch. Then over here, I've got a couple of different, this is just a, a switch for the fog lights up front. And then here's the switch for the cooling fan that mm -hmm. uh, is always on. So the danger is, is that you turn this on and then you turn it off and go get a hamburger someplace and you come back and you can hear your fan running, which of course is using battery, but um, that switch is there. And then this switch, controls the uh, auxiliary tank. I've got a 44 gallon Long Ranger automotive uh, <laughs> fuel tank that uh, hurts every time I fill it up at the oh, pump. Yeah. 44 gallons, that's a lot. The, the guy I was, that, you know, when I have to go in and pay by credit card because the credit card reader at the pump doesn't go that high, <laughs> he always looks out and sees what kind of car I'm driving to make sure that I'm actually not just pouring gas on the ground <laughs> or something. <laughs> So I can pump from, and this is a system where it pumps, actually pumps the fuel from the auxiliary into the main tank. So I can use it and then it can uh, transfer over to the gauge. Um, battery condition monitor here. 
What's the big red button underneath the, or on the steering column? <laughs> is that the ejector seat? That is a proof of concept that pretty much was a fail. Okay. That, that was, this is one of the failures that I decided really doesn't work. What this is, is a, you know, those little misters that they have on your porch when the weather gets really hot yeah. and they missed a little bit of air. Yeah. Well, that, I decided that in an effort to keep my radiator cool, I wanted to mist water in front of my radiator. And so that's what this button does. When I can see my, my uh, water temperature going up on my, on my gauge, I can push this button and it sprays water on the front of my radiator. Unless I pump a lot of water, it really has no effect at all. And I just don't have the capacity to carry that much water. So right. this really is a fail that I just haven't either taken out or repurposed quite yet. Well, now yeah. you can put it misters on the inside of your vehicle so you can miss view. <laughs> right. When Wait, it gets that's up. probably ill-conceived. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. And then all of this clutter over here with, with uh, I've got extra um, USB charging ports. I've got, I don't even know how many cigarette lighter sockets, but somehow I still seem to use them all. Um, they come in handy. You plug things in and you yeah. charge things up. And You've got a, a bazillion USB ports. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how many you actually need. And then in the center... I convert it over to, uh, so you notice one thing about this car is that it doesn't come with the typical options that an 80 series might in the U.S. This car was spec'd out very purposefully to be minimal. It doesn't have a sunroof. Most 80 series have a sunroof. Yep. It doesn't have a third seat. Most 80 series did. It doesn't have the bypass sliding third windows. It just has solid windows. Yep. Um, and it, it had a very cheap console i didn't i ha haven't seen one as cheap as this one had but i lived with it for a lot of years until i decided that i needed a little security here so i put in a toughy center console which is great i had to modify that but then on the front that wasn't good enough so i had to i i put in all of these ram mount one inch balls in front so i could use the ram mount things here. I've got one, two, and three places where I've got the one inch balls here so I can mount different things. Yeah. And that's become, that's become pretty convenient because I've got my tablet mount here. I've got my cell phone mount here. This one is one of those cheap event things that, you yeah. know, your phone falls off when you go on a rough road, which yeah. I occasionally do. And so that's what this is for. Cool. The useless cup holder way under here <laughs> where you can <laughs> with with hands my size, I can never actually even get anything out of there. So things just go in there and they never come out. <laughs> so I must have a hundred dollars in change in there. All right, let's take a look at what we've gotten back. I want to make a special mention of the door pocket. <laughs> many many homes <laughs> might have what we call a junk drawer. Yes. <laughs> where it's the drawer in the house that collects yes. everything that you don't know where to put anywhere else. Yep. This is my junk drawer. <laughs> it's got everything from, from, from emergency scissors to tire pressure gauges. It's actually a map pocket, so I actually do have maps in there. It's got tools, it's got my, it's got my four ways to start a fire little yep. kit. Um, headlamps, uh, my, my emergency beacon. You know, it's very useful. It's, it's a useful very utilitarian. Space, yeah. This is my junk drawer, so. And you always know where those things are. My uh, antique, <laughs> my antique flashlight that everybody laughs when I pull this out because they can't believe I still have a flashlight that this, that's this big. <laughs> <laughs> you can use it as a club too. Yeah. Fish club. It's better at that anyway. Well, first of all, why don't you just break down what, what we can see? This is the rear end. <laughs> of... It's the back of the vehicle. <laughs> And it's gotten pretty heavy. This this really is this this really is the uh, the heavy end of the car, uh, and and you'll see why as we delve into it a little bit more. I call it uh, it's affectionately become my my pack mule. Yeah. Um, so it, this is a Kmar rear bumper, and I think you can't even get these anymore in the U.S. And this is another one of those things that it's an Australia uh, brand. 
that tried to come into the U.S. and they did occasionally. There was a couple of people that imported them, um, but I heard that you can't get these anymore. And so I got a I got a Kmar because it was really the only game in town. There weren't other manufacturers. Yeah. Slee hadn't started building their bumpers yet and things like that. So I picked this up, uh, paid you know full retail. It was uh, crazy expensive, but it was worth it to me because I had been enough with the old bumper that it was starting to tear it up. Yeah. And you know, the plastic corners just didn't, just don't last and they don't provide any protection. And this certainly does. So I got the Kmar bumper and it has, I did get the, the one tire swing on here. This is the Kmar tire swing and um, it's heavy duty. It's solid as, as can be. And then it came with this, this little part right here that I then made this tower so I can have this little work light on mm -hmm. here. And this little work light is just operated by a little switch right here that just goes off and on. Super and it's, convenient. It's really nice. Yeah, you know, the other, no the other moon. Just, yeah. Yeah. And, and you great. can you can extend it up and lift it up and, and this even, you know, you can come off and put it anywhere you need to work. Uh, if you need to do anything on your on your car, you've got a little bit of light. Um, this swing out, you know, the, the Kmar had the dual spindles on it. And this spindle sat unused for a lot of years. And uh, I decided that I needed to carry um, some things. So what things did I want to carry? I wanted to carry uh, at least five gallons of water. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, this is wide enough to carry two five gallon containers. So I built it uh, for, that, for that purpose. And as I started building this, I realized that, hey, this is, this is pretty useful. I'll be able to put other things on here. So as I built it, I built it for initially just to carry the, the water cans. And then on the side, I decided, you know, I need a place to put my shovel and my ax. And so I made it fit the S-wing ax that I have and the little bully tools shovel that, you know, this thing's made out of steel and you just can't, you just can't hurt it. And then, of course, it has locks, so just to keep the honest people away. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then I also decided that, uh, hey, underneath here would be a perfect spot to put my high lift jack base. And so I just made a little attachment under here with a fitment that would store my high lift jack base. And so, uh, and the last thing I did was I realized that my license plate uh, needed a home with a light to be legal. And so I made this out of just uh, steel, bent some steel around here and uh, made a little home for my license plate. That is awesome. And did you fab the, did you fabricate the entire thing or was part of it part of the bumper? No, I had to start from the spindle and work out. Okay. So I had, uh, I had to build this arm and mm -hmm. this is uh, two by three inch tubing with, uh, and I have room for one more fixture here that carries different things. But these are just bolt through from, from the backside that uh, bolt through here. So I can actually take this off if I don't need it for, for weight for any reason. Uh, and I can bolt something else on. The next thing I might build is maybe a bicycle carrier if I wanted a bicycle carrier or something like that. Um, but I had to fab it from, from the spindle out. So I had a machinist friend of mine helped me build this to make it nice and strong. This rod goes all the way through from here to here and actually screws into the, the spindle here to keep things nice and tight. Um, fully welded, of course. And then I built this thing, getting it out of my brain onto paper and then into steel was a lot of fun. You know, yeah. I, I just enjoy that process so much. Uh, straps that lock, you know, for security, uh, mounts this actually uh, turns on with my reverse lights, so when I'm in reverse, it's like daylight back there. Right. It's really nice. Um, You've got your other air chuck over there. Got great. the air chuck over here. Convenient. Uh, yeah, this is this is super convenient. This is just a little pop up that just pops right out of there, and then that fits right in here. I also currently have airbags that we talked about, you know, the other night, mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is how I feel the left and right airbags independently right here. In the springs, yeah. you can fill fill each side independently. Yeah. That's great. Yep. And uh, with with the things I've got inside, I sit a little low on the rear left. 
Yep. So I put a little bit more and I measure, you know, when I'm all hooked up and I, and I uh, evaluate or I check to make sure that I'm level with the pressure in the, in the airbags. Am I got to keep that polished up? Yeah. That's uh, five to 10 horsepower. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, also while we're on the back, this, yeah. these, these mounts back here are really slick for the antennas. They just keep things out of the way. The, the coating has come off a little bit. I should probably take them off and re recoat them. They've been up there for that long, but they're a great way to mount your antenna. Um, ARB mount, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more, okay. but the awning that comes off, that's really nice. Um, and back here is where a lot of things get thrown in. Uh, I've got a sleeping platform here that if I ever need to sleep, I just fold this top section. I can put the second seat down and put the first row forward and I can actually flip this over. It takes about three minutes to put in place and it provides a nice flat spot for one person to sleep if I need to. I used to do that before my trailer. I used to sleep back here. Mm -hmm. It just became a little bit tight. Yeah. Um, and, uh. Uh, you know, I, I, I decided that I wanted a base camp, so this yeah. still I still have this in case I need it, but yeah. it just becomes uh, a place to to pile things now. You I've know, got just a, a consideration with that is yeah. is if you want to or need to uh, camp incognito mm -hmm. for any reason, you know, if you're on a long trek or whatever, and you're you don't side of a road, yeah, you don't have the out, opportunity to go way out. Yeah, you can sleep in here shut everything and people aren't sure whether you're in there or not. Right. It's one consideration. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and yeah. I have done that. Yeah. I have done the side of the road <laughs> and people don't bother you. Yeah. People, people just, you know, if I, if I had a rooftop tent and I was in the rooftop tent, that would be really obvious. Right? Yeah. yeah. But here it's, it's really is a, a good way to, to do an incognito type of a test. Um, front to back, I've got a CO2 tank in the front that I keep charged most of the time. I don't use that. That's not my primary. That's kind of my backup go-to for uh, if I need to, mostly if anybody else is airing up mm -hmm. and their Walmart compressor takes a dive, I pull yep. out the air tank and say, here, use this. And they can air up pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and then I've got my basically every tool I need to do anything I need to on this car. I've got all my tools in here, everything from rebuild the berths to um, electrical issues. I've got parts and stuff, all my toolboxes here. Um, I'm going to reveal a part of me that I'm not very proud of. Sure. However, <laughs> now that's pretty compact for yeah. the amount of work that you can do yeah so it's very it's, it, it seems yeah that's very that's efficient. also the tenth iteration of the tools that i've yeah. not used and the tools that i needed right and the double tools you know you, you need two of tens two of twelves two of fourteens but you don't need a 13 and a 15 most of the time so those aren't in there yeah and then i've got my uh my air tools in here to air down quickly to air back up quickly they're right here where i can get at them really easily and I kind of have a thing about making sure everything's tied down too. Mm -hmm. I don't want things, if I'm going over a bumpy road, I don't want things flopping around. Yeah. And so I, I, I make a big effort to make sure that everything's secured, tied down. That's why, you know, this is here and, and this is here. Things are either tied down or bolted down. So um, this used to be where my, where my chuck box would go for all my kitchen stuff. And when I lived out of the car, this was my kitchen. Mm-hmm. So I would just open my chuck box and now it's just become sort of things that need to get more organized. This is my, this is my, uh, 12 volt welder. I can weld if I need to stick weld with two or maybe three batteries. I can, I can hook up three batteries. It's got the cables and the stick welder and everything and some fresh sticks to do stick welding if I need to. What gauge stick size stick do you use with a three battery welding setup? Um, whatever melts metal. Okay. It's as good as answers I can give you. Okay. <laughs> and that's, that's also trial and error. Um, and I'm not very good at stick welding. That's how yeah. I learned to weld. Yeah. But then quickly used MIG because it was so much better. Yeah. It was just so much easier. Stick welding is, is a real art. Anybody that can stick weld well really has my respect. Lifestyle Overland, Kevin, 
Okay. Crying out loud. You really? can stack dimes with a three battery, three battery See, yeah, I need to learn. Setup. I need to learn. I'm in the learning curve. <laughs> I was like, I was like, look, I was able to create a glob of metal. And he's <laughs> right. just like stack, 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 stack. See, I'm, I'm, I'm way out of that realm right now. <laughs> way out, way out. Um, ARB fridge is, uh, something I've owned for a long time. Yeah. I, I think I bought this one when, when they first came out with this version of it. Uh, relatively new version. They had an old ARB, but when they came out with this one, this really appealed to me. It was ergonomic. I knew ARB was a good good name brand to go with. Uh, low draw on the battery. Um, you know, you can dial whatever temperature you want. I have made ice cubes with this mm -hmm. as an experiment, um, but really it's, it's the go-to for me. I, I sort of established my menus around the fact that I can refrigerate food. Yeah. I carry a lot of refrigerated food and it works well. I can, I can go out for a week with two people and this will carry the food, the bulk of the food for, for that period of time. Good friend of mine said that one of the kickers was, uh, uh, not having to put your hands in cold ice and water. Yeah. If you have a refrigerator. Not have to pull your sandwich meat out of the bottom of your <laughs> the cesspool of whatever refrigerator. You, you've been keeping cooler in there water on day five. Yeah. 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 Um, on top of that, then is is this thing, and you can see that this is pretty pretty solid in itself. But I built this around two of these boxes. And this one is for this one is for dry goods. Yep. That uh, is really convenient because it's it's here right where I need the food. And if I go away from base camp, I know I still have sandwich, lunch meat, lunch food, cookies. Yep. All the essentials. And then this one has turned into uh, where I just pack my clothes. And if I can't fit it in there, that means I'm going out for more than a week. Right. Because I need a second pair of pants. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. So that, that's become my clothes, uh, my, my laundry, fresh laundry, which is really handy. Um, it gets in a little bit in the way of the rear view, but I've become accustomed to it using my other mirrors and stuff, but it's solid. And then I can attach things to it um, when I thought I needed to. Haven't really figured out a use for this, um, but it, it will get used. It'll get purposed somehow. And then on this side, over here is the uh, is the compressor, and it's a Puma one and a half gallon tank compressor, and it's uh, a good compressor. It gets a lot of pressure fast, and I can air up four tires um, very quickly and accurately with this mm -hmm. system. And of course, it's plumbed in through into the vehicle. But I've also got a line out where I can go directly from the compressor to a small line if I need to just do one tire or somebody else's tire or something like that. Um, and you were saying that if you choose to, you can air up all, all four tires simultaneously. Yeah. And will it shut off uh, at a desired pressure or do you watch a gauge and shut it off when you're ready? I have to watch it. Yeah. I have to watch it. I tried to do that with a regulator uh -huh. and I found that the regulator was inaccurate and uh, I needed to watch it anyway, yeah. because when I reached my target pressure, I was done. So, you know, things get shut down and unscrewed and put away. Yeah. So it's just as easy to watch it as it is to have it shut off automatically. Right. So that's my, that's my current right. method. I'm, I am impressed you've kept your middle row seats as well. I've tried. I have to carry more than me sometimes. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's just me and me and uh, one passenger, but sometimes it's me and two or three passengers. So I, I really want to keep the second row for that for that reason. All right. Got my little kitchen light here. That's always a nice little add-on to uh, have back here when you need extra light. Thank you, LEDs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're great. They are. Yeah. And they don't Life draw saver. much, and they yeah. It not much heat, so well. not much draw. Right. Okay. Um, you want to talk about some of the, uh, any other external accessories you want to mention? Well, I've got the sliders. Yep. These sliders have been on there for a long time. And, you know, when I was kind of new, uh, side 
protection became important because the price of sliders is much cheaper than having your rails repaired by a body shop one, one time, right? So these are uh, sliders that uh, came from a company called 4 by Innovations. Okay. And uh, he was just beginning to build these and uh, they seem to be pretty decent. I like the little kick out for this the rear is, tire. Th so I've lost a rear fender without this. Yeah. I mean, that's a really great add on. It just, if you have to, it shoves the back end of your rig out exactly. of the way of harm's way. Exactly. And I have actually, you know, scraped off just along with the front bumper, I've, I've scraped off rocks on this. I just recently repainted this side and there was a big scrape all the way along that showed evidence that, yeah, that's, I'm glad I had that there yeah. right then at that time. So the sliders have, have paid for themselves. You know, you, you bang around and with an 80 series, especially 95 on, it takes a special slider design to protect the catalytic converters underneath. So that makes it a little bit expensive, but my cats are fully protected. And you look on the bottom of that skid plate and it's just like rock rash. Yeah. You know, that's one of the first things that, that will hit is your catalytic converters if you don't have any protection. Is, is, your, is your skid built into the slider or was that separate? It was built right into yeah. it. It's actually one of the, it's built into the mounting point of, of that part of it. Great. Yeah. And I have had to take my exhaust system apart which means I have to take the slider off, which I'm glad I made it bolt on, right? Yeah. But now it's easy to come off too. It takes me about 15 minutes and I can pull that slider off and have complete access to anything I need. Uh, that's one of the first things I'd recommend for folks when they're, if, they, if they're gonna go off-road. Yeah, even before a lift yeah. and before big tires, if you think you're gonna do it, if you think you're gonna get into the sport, you know, sliders are, are cheap insurance. They're six or eight or even a thousand dollars for a good set. And you take your car to a body shop and say, hey, I damaged my rocker panel. Now that'll be $1,200 to fix that because they're so hard to fix and it's labor intensive. So cheap insurance. All right. Rack. Want to talk about the and, roof rack? Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. So this is new. This is the funnest new thing I, I have. I, I used to have. An, uh, an old original confer roof rack which was absolutely bulletproof and great but it was really heavy and not very uh it had become not very utilitarian for me mm -hmm. and so i saw this uh guy that was made this uh, particular design similar to a prinsu but it's uh it's called bofin cruisers that designed this and his unique design which i really liked uh, was the latches, the tie downs, which is an over center type of a latch. And then it bolts through here like this, that really, really sold me on this rack, but it's the aluminum extrusion cross pieces, crossbars that, uh, are really nice, nice. And they're all modular. And I've got my, I actually made a very simple mount for my high lift jack up here with a quick fist rubber clamp on the back to hold the back end of it because there's almost no weight back there. This is where all the weight is, so this is where the mount is. I just mounted my shovel up there with quick fist, mm -hmm. the simple bolt through that slide right in the extrusions, very simple. Did the same thing to my solar panel up there and very simple. Um, these are uh, Tread Pros. Tread is another Australian brand that competes with Max Tracks. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to go with Treads. Uh, what was the reasoning then? I think price mm -hmm. was a big was a big point of it. You never see Max Tracks really on sale. Yeah, they're you know small percentages off between store front to storefront. These I got for a pretty decent price, um, and I like them. They're they're pretty rugged. Uh, I've used them a couple of times and they don't show any wear at all, but I needed a place to mount them. And I actually built this mount for my old confer rack. Um, and then I just adapted it to, to this rack. I actually made this and it's, it, it's, you know, super simple and it comes off really easy. I don't want to unbolt anything. I don't want any, any wing nuts that are going to get stuck or frozen yeah. or muddy or anything like that. So I just keep this on with, with bungee cords 
and you know it's solid it's not going to go anywhere yep um these leashes are kind of a an annoyance but without a leash you're going to lose it in the mud anyway on on the on the roof rack if you remove this then does this un this un unclips um you have to unclip it you have to yeah you can you this bolt is just the the security uh-huh so you undo this bolt and then you flip this lever up and then this drops down and it releases right. it got it right yeah that's cool and it's I, got I, four I, tie downs four clamps uh-huh i like that it's flat on the top as well yeah it's not contoured or anything like that it's nice and flat so yep. you can keep whatever you want up there that's yeah great. and i wouldn't hesitate putting a, a rooftop tent on top of this at all yeah. it's plenty sturdy yeah um luggage anything that's that's you need to tie down is going to go up there without any problem and i, I made my uh i adapted my um mounts to put my arb awning back here that was an easy mm -hmm. about 15 minutes with the welder and put on some tabs on my old awning mounts and was able to adapt my awning for that does the awning pull straight out straight out the, the back, back yeah. about eight feet mm -hmm. about eight feet and it's great if if you know you're working in back you need some shade for lunch or something like that like right it's now it's really simple yeah <laughs> yeah it's starting That's to warm great. up isn't it what else should we uh what else should we know about your rig hmm talked about uh did we talk about suspension a little bit oh let's go ahead and talk about that yeah so again uh one of the premier brands when i started building this was oame yep that was kind of the brand to have uh and i knew i wanted some quality because i didn't want to mess with it a lot i didn't want to be changing parts or worrying about the quality of this uh i have changed the rear springs twice started with a the mild spring and then i added my uh, the weight in the back the bumper and everything um, and as i got heavier and heavier i finally ended up with i think they're the 864 springs which are the highest uh, load rating uh, single rate spring that they had uh, and it does a pretty good job it does a pretty good job with my trailer on there it sits about level i do have airbags in there to level out from side to side and then with OME shocks and a stabilizer up front, it, it rides pretty well. One of the things I did add back here uh, was the Long Ranger automotive. I touched on it a little bit, but it's 44 gallons of gas. Yeah. And 44 gallons at eight gallon, eight pounds per gallon uh, can add some weight. So when I'm, I'm fully loaded, full of fuel, it's pretty heavy going down the road. Yeah. And you you, you with the heavy springs, it really helps that ride, smooths out that ride. Are you able to get level with, with a full? Uh, I am, but as soon as tank. I put my tra tra uh, trailer on with a full tank of fuel, yeah. I sit a little bit back heavy. Mm -hmm. And so with air in the springs, it brings me right up to where I need to be. And I measure from the ground up to this point right here. Mm -hmm. And I make sure both sides are the same. And it, it really does wonders for the ride Great. to make sure I'm not squirming on the road. So Dan, I've learned a heck of a lot uh, just walking around your rig. Like I said, I think my 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 pocketbook is, is going to get some dents in it after this. Well, it's been 18 um, years of education for me. <laughs> it, it, and it shows. It's it's awesome. It's a very efficient rig. Um, how can people get in touch with you? I'm on Instagram. Okay. Uh, my handle is uh, VC Expedition. Stands for Vehicle Centric Expedition. I'd love uh, some likes and yep. follows and shares. It's great. I love it. I have a lot of fun with it. Yeah. I think the, the 80 series folks are going to reach out to you. I'd be glad <laughs> to. You know, there's a lot of community wisdom around the 80s. They've been around yeah. for a long time and there's a huge amount of knowledge. I'm yep. kind of scraping the surface a little bit. Mm -hmm. I've sifted out what, what works for me and what's kind of the fluff that I don't need. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd be glad to, I, I could talk about 80 series and Toyotas all day long. So go check out uh, Dan, it's VC Expedition on, on Instagram. And um, we also might be collaborating on some more technical articles on overlandbound.com that Dan would write. Uh, he's got a wealth of information and knowledge given his background and look forward to, to doing stuff together. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, thanks, thanks Michael. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks.